Hello, and welcome to Lesson 7. In this lesson, we're going to look at the closest star to us, um, the Sun. And astronomy started out from the Greek study of the stars. And the closest star and the easiest star to study is the one that's up during the day, our Sun. So as an introduction into the broader topic of stars and the galaxy, we're going to take a close look at how our star works. And then we'll be able to use that to understand how other stars will also work. So let me know if you have any questions and enjoy the lecture. In this lesson, we are going to talk about the Sun. And the Sun is the closest star to us, so studying the Sun will give us a good idea about how other stars will act. And the Sun is a very dynamic um, body. It's incredibly large, and it is full of mystery. So in this lesson, we want to talk about how the Sun works. Um, the Sun is a giant ball of gas, and this gas is in a very hot state so the electrons are ripped off of the protons and the hydrogen so it is in a state that we call a plasma state so there's lots of things we can know about the sun and one of those things is that it takes 8.3 minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth um, the sun has a radius of 109 earth radii and its mass is equal to 333,000 earth masses the sun is 74% hydrogen, 1% hel or 25% helium, and 1% other elements. So the sun is pretty much a hydrogen and helium gas. Um, when you look at the sun, um, it is just a large ball of gas, so it obviously does not have a solid surface. But if you look at it through a telescope using the proper filters, it appears as if it does have a surface. Some of the gravitational pressure pushes the gas together, and so the sun forms many layers. And one of those layers is the photosphere. And the photosphere is where the sun's visible light comes from. So to us, when we look at it through a telescope, it appears to be a solid surface. So the surface is really a thin layer of the sun. Um, it's only 400 kilometers thick, or we can only see about 400 kilometers into it. And everything below this surface or photosphere um, is called the solar interior. So just like the Earth has an atmosphere, um, the sun being a large ball of gas, um, there happens to be a couple more layers above the photosphere, above the part that appears to be like a surface. One of those layers is called the chromosphere, and the other is called the corona. And we will need special techniques to study those layers. Another thing that you'll observe um, on the sun is called limb darkening. And it looks like the outer edges of the sun are darker than the center. And this is caused by where the light is being produced. The photosphere changes temperature as you go up um, from the depths of the sun to the surface. And if you look at the center of the sun, you're seeing light coming from closer or to the lower depths where it's hotter, so that light is brighter. If you look at the light coming from the edges of the sun, it's being produced at a cooler part of the photosphere, and therefore it is darker. So if I look at the sun through a spectrometer, I see an absorption line spectrum. I see a black body spectrum, and the black body spectrum tells us that the photosphere has an average temperature of 5,800 degrees Kelvin. But the upper level of the atmosphere cools to around 4,400 Kelvin. So since I have a cooler gas between me and the hot, hotter gas, I get an absorption line spectrum. And it's this absorption line spectrum that tells us the composition of the hydrogen, the helium, and the 1% heavier metals. So another thing that we'll observe, if you take a look at the sun um, through a telescope with the proper filters, you'll see granulation. And it looks like there's granules across the surface of the sun. And these are caused by convection currents. Just like a pot of hot water, um, the hot water from the bottom of the pot rises to the top and the cooler water from the top sinks to the bottom. The gas in the sun does the same thing. So right below the photosphere, as the gas cools off in the photosphere, it falls back down towards the hotter regions of the sun and the core. And the hot gases 
um, rise up to replace it. And this region of the sun is called the convective zone. And it's this convective zone that carries energy um, up to the surface of the core. And this is the part of the sun where the energy is being carried outward from the core um, through convection or through the transfer of material. So the photosphere is in constant motion. And this is a video um, taken of the photosphere over a short period of time. Um, right above the photosphere, we have the chromosphere. Um, it has a density of 10 to the minus 8 times the density of our own atmosphere. Um, here, it's dominated by a emission line at 656 nanometers. Um, this is a very specific emission line that belongs to hydrogen, and it's called the H-alpha line of hydrogen. Um, so I can identify hydrogen in the chromosphere. I can also find lines from calcium and helium and other heavy metals in the chromosphere. So as I look at the chromosphere, I find that the temperature rises above that of the photosphere. And looking at the spectral analysis, um, I can see that the temperature rises up to 25,000 Kelvin at about 2,000 kilometers above the photosphere. So as I leave the photosphere, the sun is getting hotter. And if I remove all of the wavelengths except for the H alpha line, I see these filaments that are shooting up out of the photosphere into the chromosphere. These filaments are called specules, and they may, they may be rising at 20 kilometers per second and get as high as 10,000 kilometers. They last about 15 minutes and we may have around 300,000 at any given time. Outside of the chromosphere, we go through a transition, transitional phase and we reach the corona. This corona is the sun's outermost level. It can reach out for distances of several million kilometers and eventually it turns into a high speed gas of protons and electrons that we call the solar wind. So the corona, though, is only one millionth the brightest of the photosphere, and it's about the same brightness as the full moon. So if the sun is there, you cannot see it. The only time you'll be able to see the corona is if you observe a total solar eclipse, or if you have special equipment to remove the light from the sun from your image. So as I look at the corona, I find it gets incredibly hot. So looking at the spectral analysis, we again see emission lines, and we find temperatures of an excess of 2 million degrees Kelvin. So the corona gets even hotter than the chromosphere or the photosphere. Now, it's very, very hot, but if I was to stand in the corona, I would not get burnt. It's the same thing about putting your hand in the oven versus a pot of hot water. The gas is at such a low density, it does not have a lot of thermal energy, but the gas has a lot of kinetic energy, which gives it that high temperature. So when I look at the corona, we get a lot of radiation, a lot of the charged particles coming off of the corona. Um, we also get a lot of light coming from the corona that is in the X-ray region and the ultraviolet region. The particles have so much kinetic energy, they're moving so rapidly that they undergo a lot of collisions, and these collisions also often produces X-rays and ultraviolet light. Um, in the figure, um, this is two ultraviolet images. Um, the black ring is a separation between the images. And you can see um, the sun and then the corona surrounding it. So the corona is much larger than the sun inside of the photosphere. And you'll see black holes. Those are coronal holes where it is the easiest for material to escape from the sun. So some of this material escapes in very violent events. But sometimes we just get coronal holes where this charged particles can leave at 1.8 million miles an hour, and that's twice as fast as they'll escape from other places. Um, these release mass in violent eruptions called coronal mass ejections, and they can be as great as 10 to the 12 kilograms of mass with velocities of up to hundreds of kilometers per second. Um, if one of these is aimed at the Earth, it creates havoc on our communications and our satellites, and it has created havoc on our electrical systems. Um, the corona, as we mentioned before, um, is the, one of the hottest regions. It's definitely the hottest region in the atmosphere of the sun. And here, temperatures can reach as high as 4 million Kelvin. And the collisions between particles produce um, coronal mass ejections. And oftentimes, these areas are centered over something we call a sunspot. And we'll talk about sunspots in a minute. 
but the sunspots move around and they can create these coronal mass ejections. So there you can see that we have a very large peak of mass um, being ejected and at the same time we had a flash of a sunspot. So if we want to watch that again. So you see a very large um, amount of light in the x-ray region during the time we have a sunspot or a coronal mass ejection. So as a former review, we have a photosphere, which is about 100 to 400 kilometers thick and a mean temperature of 5,400 degrees Kelvin. Um, the chromosphere, which is a few thousand kilometers thick and reaches temperatures of 20,000 Kelvin, and a corona, which is millions of kilometers thick and can reach millions of degrees Kelvin. So looking at the sun then, uh, we've only talked about the atmosphere and the outer layers of the sun, but we can see that if I look at the total picture, I have a core, um, a radiative zone, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, I also then have a convective zone where the energy that's being produced in the core is carried to the surface by convection. I then have my photosphere on top of that, and the photosphere cools as I go through it. And then outside the photosphere, I reach the chromosphere where the temperatures, the density of the gas gets much less, but the temperature increases. And outside of that, I have the corona, which goes for millions of kilometers and is in millions of degrees and very, very low density. Um, I also can have sunspots and solar flares and prominences and quite a few other events on the sun. So let's take a minute and take a look at sunspots and see how sunspots can be understood. So a sunspot is a region on the sun. Um, it appears dark and it has a not quite as dark area surrounding it. Um, the dark central core we call the umbra. Um, the brighter border we call the penumbra. And they appear dark because they are lower in temperature than the surrounding photosphere. And they can be quite large. Um, they can be many times the size of the Earth. And these are on the surface of the sun, or these are events on the photosphere. Um, they're dark for a couple of reasons. The umbra appears red, while the penumbra appears orange, and it's because of the differences in temperature. Um, the umbra is at 4300 Kelvin, and the penumbra is at 5000 Kelvin. Um, that's much different than the photosphere temperature of about 5800 degrees Kelvin. So we can use the Stefan-Boltzmann law to relate the energy of this black body to this temperature. And comparing the two, I see the flux from the penumbra divided by the flux from the photosphere. And putting that in Stefan's law, I get 0.3, or the umbra is only emitting 30% the amount of light of the rest of the photosphere, which is why they appear dark. Watching the sunspots, we can see that the sun rotates. Galileo was the first one to discover this, and by tracking these sunspots, he found that the sun rotates once every four weeks. In the 1900s, a fellow named Richard Carrington found that the sun does not rotate as if it's a solid ball. Different parts of the sun rotate in different periods. Um, the equator has a period of 25 days, while at 30 degrees, the period is 27 and a half days, and at 70 degrees, the period is 33 days. So the closer the equator, the greater the period, or the greater the rotation rate. Um, I know the maximum number of sunspots um, varies with time, and it goes through an 11-year cycle. And the sun, as the cycle progresses, um, the location of the sunspots change. Um, they start to appear around 30 degrees, and as the cycle progresses, they clear closer and closer to the equator, and they're around the equator at the peak of the cycle. So. Here, um, we can see the period if we trace the number of sunspots or the area of the sun covered by sunspots, um, we can see that it repeats itself about every 11 years. And if I look at the latitude of the sunspots, I can see that around the peaks, I get more sunspots towards the equator. 
Um, the sun produces a magnetic field. Remember, the sun is a plasma, which means I have a lot of protons with a positive charge and electrons with negative charges zipping around. And they're not bound into an atom where the charges cancel each other out. And these particles moving around form a dynamo. And this dynamo creates very strong magnetic fields. So when we look at a sunspot, um, if we put it through a spectroscope, we see that when the sunspot goes in front of our spectroscope, the lines split into two. This is an effect called the Zeeman effect, and it shows that the sunspots are regions of very powerful magnetic fields. And here well, you get a north pole and a south pole, so these sunspots always occur in pairs. And they can twist up these magnetic fields, and the magnetic field will cross and sometimes break, causing an ejection of an enormous amount of energy and an enormous amount of mass. So these magnetic fields are able to deflect charged particles. So if I have a region of very strong magnetic field, it deflects the plasma that's coming up from the interior of the sun and the convective zone and pushes it out around the sunspot. So in this region, the sun remains cooler, leaving the hotter gas flowing around the outside edge and hence gives us a sunspot. So we can take a magnetic picture of the sun and it's called a magnetogram and it looks at the positive and negative and we see that these things behave as they are particles and that they are constantly flowing just like a bar magnet with a positive and negative end. Okay that is the end of part one of this lecture. Um, in part two we will discuss um, how the sun produces its energy um, in the core of the sun.